The following sermon is by Pastor Greg Dutcher. More information can be found online at ChristFC.org. We uh, come this morning in our journey through the book of Joshua to the second chapter. A uh, few people have asked me about the title, and uh, Rahab is my, one of my favorite characters in the entire Bible. Uh, she is a sophisticated lady, and I'm using sophisticated and chic, not in uh, the modern sense, but in the more classical sense of a savvy, earthy, wise, and winsome woman. Uh, and I love those kind of women. I think the world needs more and more of them that are gutsy, uh, that are earthy, that have great, strong faith and uh, get their hands dirty for the cause of the kingdom of God. And I think Rahab is such a woman. I think sometimes we have a cliche treatment of her when we consider her role in the Bible, sort of as a standalone incident. I hope to show uh, by the end of our message this morning that she is... Uh, a very significant figure in the history, not just of the Bible, but of the entire world. I know that's a strong statement. I trust the scripture will prove that and bear it out for you. Uh, let me uh, turn our interest to the text this morning. It's the entire second chapter. And the thing with narrative is sometimes you need to do an entire chapter to get the one point. If you break it up, it's going to be a little artificial. So I did not want to break it up this morning because if you don't read the whole chapter, we'll miss the whole point of the story. We don't normally do this at um, CFC. Try not to do things um, too often with too much regularity. Uh, a good friend of mine once said, if you want to form a tradition in the church, just do something two weeks in a row and you've got a tradition. So we mix it up from time to time. We don't always do this. But for our purposes this morning, I'd like to ask you to stand in deference to the word of God as I read all 24 verses of Joshua chapter 2. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords. And the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sahan and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will Save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, go into the hills or the pursuers will encounter you and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward you may go your way. The men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house, your father and mother, your brothers and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. 
But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your word, so be it. Then she sent them away, and they departed. She tied the scarlet cord in the window. They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned. And the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua the son of Nun. And they told him all that happened to them. And they said to Joshua, truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands. And also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. So remain on our feet for a moment just to pray. Lord, thank you for this word. I pray that you would stir faith in our hearts, through the, uh, all of our hearts this morning, to believe that this is not a fictitious story. This is not a myth or a fable or a fairy tale to impart some flimsy principle. We are actually reading true history. Because of these events, Lord, history changed. Because of this passage, something happened that is affecting us down to this very moment in time. I pray, Father, that you would arrest the attention of everyone here this morning. I pray, Father, that your glory would be put on clear display so that through the eyes of a harlot named Rahab, we might share the same confession great and gracious God you indeed are. May you do this, Lord, for the sake and name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, this text is lengthy, but it's actually quite simple in the narrative that unfolds. There is something that I think the writer here wants us to see and he wants us to see it by the way the passage is actually structured. I would argue this is sort of a, uh, a club sandwich. Shocking that I would give such an analogy, I know. Uh, but it is the 1030 service, and my mind is beginning to think about what's beyond. But I think you will see a clear structure in this passage. And I have ordered it, or tried to order it in such a way, that you will see what's at the center. What's the meat of the story, as it were. First, the passage starts with the commissioning of the spies by Joshua. There's two men that he sends to do a reconnaissance mission of sorts into the promised land to get a handle on how things look. And then you'll notice that the next several verses are devoted to this theme of their arrival and their protection. Let me skip the middle so we can come back to it. I want you to notice how parallel this is. There is the escape of the spies and the protection of Rahab. Just as the spies enter and there's protection, so they exit and there's protection. And then I want you to notice it comes full circle and it goes back to their return to Joshua. So he has structured this text in such a way that we should be asking, what's, what's at the center there? What stands alone without a parallel account? And that's not hard to see. It consumes a good chunk of verses in there and it is the confession of Rahab the prostitute. If we walk away and don't have a good handle on that confession, I would argue that we miss the entire point of Joshua 2. In fact, if we have endless quibbles and disputes on whether or not Rahab was right to quote unquote lie to the men who came seeking to apprehend these spies, we will miss the entire point. We're going to have to make a few comments about it, and we will. But I just wanted you to see how this text is laid out for us to consider. Notice how it starts. Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. Now, you may immediately think, is this a lapse in Joshua's faith? Has he all of a sudden started relying on human conventional wisdom and strategery rather than relying on the Lord? Because he has, for all intents and purposes, been completely trusting in God and his word. As we've seen in chapter 1, Joshua will be strong and courageous. There's no military commands really given in chapter 1. It's all about prepare your food and your basic supplies. God's going to give you the land. Now, is Joshua faltering in that a little bit? Is he relying too much on human strength and wisdom by 
sort of authorizing his own recon mission. Well, I think we need to remember that God himself insisted on a similar mission with Joshua's predecessor, Moses. Remember back in Numbers 13. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. Send spies. I'm giving the land. We keep seeing this tension, don't we, all through Joshua? God says, I'm going to give you the land, but you're going to do things. I'm going to give it to you. You're going to fight for it. I have promised it for you, but you will cause this people to inherit it. We have this constant tension between God's sovereign power and man's responsibility, and the scriptures will not let us out of that. And we see it here. There's nothing wrong in this setting with Joshua doing this recon mission. Keep in mind, he hasn't been given his specific instructions for how they're going to take the promised land. And then when he finally gets them, they're kind of weird. I mean, the first city they go to is a heavily fortified city. I would expect instructions on battering rams, you know, rope climbers, torch throwers. I would expect all sorts of things on how to get into a fortified city. And instead, we get this rather counterintuitive command to march around a city for seven days and then blow a trumpet. I want you to imagine your famous general like Eisenhower or you know, Douglas MacArthur and you give that order to the men. Men, put away your swords and I want you to blow this clarinet and we'll see what happens. This is the kind of command Joshua is going to get, but he hasn't even received it yet. So for now, what does he have? He has reasonable, common sense means and they are not adverse to faith. Notice what commentator David Jackman says. In the absence of any direct divine instruction, Joshua is doing the responsible thing in sending out his scouts. He is using the means that are at his disposal. That is not an unspiritual course of action. Indeed, to pray without using the means that God has given us is almost as foolish as to use the means without praying. The two need to be combined together in all of our battles. I think that's a helpful tip for all of us. We are never commanded to stop using our minds and common sense when we're trusting God. Never. We are combined to trust God and use our means. Some have said we are to do the natural and let God do the supernatural. This is exactly what Joshua is doing by sending out these spies. So he sends two men on this reconnaissance mission and I don't think you and I are as shocked by this verse because we kind of expect it. But this would have been a shocking verse in its context. And they went and they came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. Now, all you have to do to get a sense on how shocking that is in our day and age is if we had one of our teens come up here and report on their summer missions trip. We've had that in the past. And a teenager says, yeah, we went to the Dominican Republic. You know, we went down to Chile, we went here, we went there, and the first place that we went to and lodged in was a brothel. You'd probably all be looking around like, uh, should we say anything about that? Are the pastors going to get up and interrupt him or her? And they said, yeah, and so we lodged there in this house of prostitution. And the madam who was there gave us a great welcome. We would feel uncomfortable. But we see it in the Bible, and it's just, yeah, that's what it's supposed to be because it's the story of Rahab. Think about this. There are two men that have gone to what we would call a house of ill repute. They're in the red light district here. And they enter into Rahab's home. Now, there are certain commentators, liberal commentators, that don't have the commitment we would share to the inspiration of the Bible that have had all sorts of fanciful theories and conjecture here which suggests that men are doing what they've done from the beginning of time, and they're doing inappropriate things here. But I think we will see as we read the story that is not the case at all. This is a strategic move. Again, scholar David Howard says this, Rahab's house was likely a way station, inn, tavern, or a combination of these. It would have been a logical place for spies to frequent. Why? Because it's a public gathering place and a potential source of information. This is where the people go. It's where they talk. So these two spies kind of slip in there. It's not going to be uncommon to see two men walk into such a place. So they seek to mingle and learn the lay of the land. What indeed is the strength of the military? Are they aware of us? Is anybody on post? Are there any sentinels on a 
watch gates somewhere that are taking a look across the Jordan to see what may be happening. In fact, this plan is good, but we see an immediate backfire, what appears to be a backfire. Notice the text. And it was told to the king of Jericho, behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Somebody in this house of ill repute has overheard these guys, is aware of who they are, and immediately goes and reports to the king. Now, the reader at this point should have great tension, shouldn't we? But again, we're used to the story. This is kind of what it's like if you watch the show 24 and you've watched after season one. Remember the first season? I mean, you actually thought Jack, ba Jack Bauer might die in every episode. Remember how brilliant that was, season one? Every single episode ends with some assassin closing in on him and the clock, doop, 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 and then it went to commercial and you had to wait a week to wait and see what's going to happen to him. And then by season four, they try to conjure up the same kind of tension, but Lisa would turn to me and say, you want me to go make a sandwich? Yeah, please do. It's episode three. There's 21 more episodes. They're not going to kill Kiefer Sutherland. But anyway, I digress. Here... You're in the story. You have no idea what's going to happen to these guys if you're reading it for the first time. They go to this place to get information. The king finds out, are they going to lose their lives? Is this mission going to be aborted very quickly, in other words? Well, the tension is right there for us to see and experience. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab. That means he dispatched a few of his henchmen, saying... Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, true, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. Let me say that again. Let's not dodge this. Notice what Rahab says. True, the men did come to me, but I did not know where they were from. We're going to find out in a few verses. She knew exactly where they were from and exactly what their purpose was. And she says, but I didn't know. Which has led students of the Bible for millennia now to ask, was it right for Rahab to lie? And this is where we can really get wrapped around the axle here. Was it right? for her to lie. Or some have asked, was it even a lie? Now, on the surface of it, you know, I mean, if you were to say to me, Greg, are you bald? And I look back at you and said, I am not. You would probably suspect I'm lying or I'm extremely deceived. I do say that I have a wide part, but <laughs> it goes right down the middle. My kids say it's like an airport runway, but it's still a part, I argue. Um, it seems that she's lying. Are the spies here? No. They're not. I don't know anything about them. So we have to wrangle with this just a little bit, and we, we see this in the New Testament, that they're not afraid to talk about Rahab. In fact, they're not afraid to talk about her at all. But she's commended on some very specific things in two New Testament passages. The first is in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Now, I want you to notice that she did not perish. And what is she specifically commended for? Not her verbal response, but to her courageous and hospitable welcome. Lisa and I just watched uh, Lone Survivor recently, the incredibly powerful story of uh, Navy SEAL Marcus Luttrell and the men that were with him on a mission that went bad quickly. And uh, perhaps you have seen that or perhaps know the story at one point. Uh, Mark Wahlberg's character, Luttrell, is given safe haven in an Afghan village, which was as shocking to him as it is to the viewer. But because there had been a 2,000-year-old tradition in that village that you always showed hospitality to people in need, regardless of any circumstance, and ask no question, and would risk your life for them. It's, it's an amazing story how this man survived. Rahab is commended for similar selfless action here in the New Testament. There's no comment here about what she said. And maybe the book of James will help us. 
And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works? That means something different, but that's another sermon for another day. When she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. So please notice yet again, Rahab is commended without embarrassment in the New Testament, but no comment about what she said, only what she did. So what, what about what she said? There's no answer that you'll find. Old or New Testament about this. There is a silent commentary. The director does not on the DVD special set tell you, now what's going on here is blank. We just don't have it. So what about some of the heavyweights from the history of the church? Well, let me give you two. The most notable men of the Protestant Reformation were undoubtedly first John Calvin. This is what he said about Rahab. He said, as to the falsehood, we must admit that though it was done for a good purpose, it was not free from fault. For those who hold what is called a dutiful lie to be altogether excusable do not sufficiently consider how precious truth is in the sight of God. Therefore, although our purpose be to assist our brethren, it can never be lawful to lie. Because in that, that cannot be right, which is contrary to the nature of God, and God is truth. So Calvin looked at this passage and simply said she was wrong to lie, which begs the question, what other options did she have? And he doesn't respond in his commentary, but understand what he's saying. And then you have the more saucy, earthy Martin Luther, who had a slightly different take. <laughs> this is pretty funny. A good, hearty lie. <laughs> a, a good, hearty lie for the sake of the, of, of the good and for the Christian church. A lie in case of necessity, a useful lie. They have rather different takes, don't they? Now, I'm terrified that teenagers are going to be going home. And when they're busted on their breaking of a curfew or something, and they're caught later on for telling some sort of fabrication, they would say, Ah, oh, Father, it was a good hearty lie that I told you. I simply came in. Yes, I see parents advising their kids to go with Calvin instead of Luther. Let you fight that out for yourselves. Um, here's my brilliant insight. I don't know. <laughs> Close the sermon, post it, we're done. Um, really don't. I think it's a difficult question. Uh, seminary professor of mine, Dr. Robert Vernoy, had an interesting take on this. He agreed that it's always wrong to lie. Therefore, what Rahab did may have looked like a lie, but it wasn't a lie and had sort of an elaborate defense that a lie must include a motivation to self-serve and self-advance. Rahab's lie was selfless. I don't know. I simply do not know. The Bible is silent on it. But I think Dale Ralph Davis has a wonderful uh, catalyst for us to move forward. He says, it is tragic when people snag their pants on the nail of Rahab's lie quibble endlessly about the matter and never get around to hearing Rahab's truth, which is the point of the story. So I would encourage you this week, I'm sure in community groups, we'll have some good discussions on this topic. Uh, Mark Sweeney will write the questions and uh, I'm sure he will share my rather tepid, safe non-view and then ask you to come up with one of your own. But I think Dale Ralph Davis is spot on here when he says, we can have this conversation, but if it becomes an endless quibbling and all we get out of Rahab 2 is, or uh, Joshua 2 is whether or not it's acceptable to do this, we're going to miss the point. Remember how the whole passage was structured? It's structured to lead us to the meat in the middle, which is what? This woman makes a confession. It's an incredible, unashamed, passionate confession about the God of Israel. Please notice, she sees three things about God that I think need to be highlighted. First, we might say God's muscle. I had might there initially, but I like muscle, particularly in light of how she describes them. She goes to the spies on the roof and she says, I know who you are, but more importantly, I know who your God is. She says, we have heard, notice, we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. In other words, there's something that doesn't happen every day. 
And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sahan and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. She is not enamored with the good military skills of the Israelite soldiers, is she? She doesn't say, wow, you're a really well-trained army. He says, I've heard how the Lord, Yahweh, created a dry path through the sea down which your people walked. Never heard anything like that. I've heard how mighty he is. I've heard about your God's muscle. She also tells the spies that she's heard about his majesty. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now, that is a radical statement for a hooker to make. A prostitute who is outside of the people of God. Why? Because this is a rampant polytheistic age. There is a God and goddess on every street corner in the land of Canaan. There's no shortage of gods for crops and fertility and rain and protection and health and wellness. There's, there's a God and goddess for everything under the sun, city to city, tribe to tribe. Why in the book of Deuteronomy, under Moses' final leadership moment, does he remind the people of what Orthodox Jews today still call the Shema? Listen, hear Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Why is Moses insisting on that? Because they're going into a world where there's a God and goddess everywhere. And they're going to be tempted to start thinking, you know what? I hear this farmer over here. His crops are doing pretty well. What's the God he prays to? Who's the goddess that's been invoked for this healing or, or that? And they must have it drilled into their minds. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. It is a bold monotheistic statement in a polytheistic world. We need that today. That same conviction that there is one God. He is majestic. Notice how he is described here. He is the God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath, which means what? He's the one true God of everything. And a prostitute in Jericho believes it. When many Israelites did not but she believed, but the gutsiest part of her confession is coming up. Think about what she knows of this God. He has got great muscle. He is majestic, and maybe he's a God of mercy. Maybe there's some mercy for her. This is why I call her a sophisticated, chic lady. She is gutsy. She has strong, bold faith. She's not afraid to put it out there. She says, now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. I want you to notice she is banking on the fact that maybe this great, majestic, one true God who has destroyed enemy armies might show mercy to a whore. That's what she's banking on. That's what she's trusting. She is a gutsy lady. Notice there's no mention of her father, or rather her husband, but her father. There is no husband. It is likely to conclude that her father was rather embarrassed by his daughter's survival skills and how she found her way in this brutal, cruel world. But she is hoping not just that mercy would come to her, but to her entire family and their entire family. She believes that maybe the mercy of God is that wide and deep. This is what the writer wants us to see in Rahab. Not endless quibbling about her lies, but wonder about her worship She reminds me of other women in Scripture. 
Fast forward centuries to the New Testament. Remember in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus enters a house and did not want anyone to know. He's trying to keep himself on the down low, so to speak. Yet it could not be hidden. At this point, his fame is growing. But immediately, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit, notice this, heard of him. Do you notice that? She heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now, the woman was a Gentile. She's an outsider, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she, notice, begs him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Do you notice the women that get it right never presume on God's mercy? They beg for it. We live in a culture where everybody just assumes that God will be merciful to them. The only requirement to go to heaven today, you know all you have to do is die. That's it. Every funeral, every memorial, I'm going to one this afternoon that I ever go to anymore, regardless of a person's fate, how it was professed or not, they're just in heaven because they died. And there is a presuming on God's mercy rather than the assuming that we deserve judgment and maybe God might extend mercy that I do not deserve. And this woman begs Jesus to cast out the demon from her little girl. And Jesus' response here is uncomfortable. It's one of the most shocking, uncomfortable moments in the Gospels. And he said to her, let the children be fed first Notice what he says to her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Is he calling her a dog? Keep in mind, in this culture, dogs were not like Lassie and Ubu and Fido. They were considered mangy creatures, cursed creatures in many cases. Paul in Philippians 3 calls the enemies of the gospel dogs. This woman's asked for mercy, and Jesus says, it's not right to take it from the children and give it to dogs. Is he being cruel to her? It seems like that on first glance, but I want you to notice this sophisticated, chic, savvy lady's response. She answered him, yes, Lord. She doesn't miss a beat. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And if there's a crumb for me, I'll take it. Boy, she's sophisticated. She doesn't miss a beat. Jesus has tested her to see if she believes that there is mercy for an outsider. And she stays in the game. And notice how Jesus responds. And he said to her, for this statement... You may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home. Can you imagine her joy? And found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. There was mercy for her. Sound familiar? James Edwards says of this Syrophoenician woman, the Gentile woman is not offered a separate revelation of God or a righteousness apart from Israel. She fully accepts the uniqueness and authenticity of God's revelation to Israel. This is my favorite part. So fully does she appreciate that revelation that she trusts its superabundance to spill over and include her people and others like her. Rahab is a prostitute in an enemy land that God has promised to give to another people. But she believes that maybe there is a superabundance of mercy And she asks it not for herself, but her entire family as well. Charles Spurgeon said this. I'm going to give you two great quotes of God's mercy. God's mercy is so great that you may sooner drain the sea of its water or deprive the sun of its light or make space too narrow than to diminish the great mercy of God. And my favorite from an unknown Puritan, Richard Sibbs, let this quote rock your world. There is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. 
I don't think most people believe that. There is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. I cannot tell you the people I've talked to through the years who honestly feel they could never become a Christian because they were too messed up. Somewhere along the line, sometimes it's the church's fault, they got the impression that there's a prerequisite step that you got to clean yourself up a little so Jesus can clean yourself up a little more. But it's the women like Rahab and the Syrophoenician woman that are under no illusions. There's nothing they can do to clean themselves up. They can simply throw themselves on the mercy of God and trust that it is enough. A person who has never set foot in church who's never voted Republican, who's never eaten at Chick-fil-A, who's never driven a minivan with a fish on the back of it, does not need to fulfill those four prerequisite steps in order to receive the mercy of God. My good friend Don Sands was what he calls himself a, a hopeless drunk for 17 years. And there in a post-drunken stupor, severe hangover, he found Jesus Christ waiting to give him his mercy. Changed his life. A man like John Newton, who if you ever saw the wonderful movie Amazing Grace, has that scene where he starts calling out these exotic sounding African names. And others are trying to comfort him. What is wrong, John? And these are the names of the Africans who died as cargo on his slave trading ships that he would toss into the ocean to lighten the load. And he remembers these beautiful exotic names that he, he threw into the depths of the sea and was amazed that God would show mercy to him and wrote that hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, now I'm found, was blind, but now I see there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. And this is what Rahab reminds us of. So these spies give her a sure sign. When we come into the land, they say, you shall tie this scarlet cord to the window. Now, this is very similar to the book of Exodus. You will recall when God was going to visit the land of Egypt in judgment, he asked them to apply the blood of the lamb to their doorposts. When the angel of death passed over, he would see this blood and know that they were marked by the mercy of God and he would pass over and not bring death on their household. Very similar. Now, um, I've heard sermons since I became a Christian on the scarlet cord representing the blood of Christ. I think that's a very reasonable conclusion. I'm not going to say it with as much confidence as I would some other things because that, it, that connection is never explicitly made anywhere else in Scripture. It's never made explicitly. Now, it goes all the way back to the early church fathers in the late first and early second century. People have been arguing this. Spurgeon, greats have done sermons on this. I think it is interesting that it's scarlet, that it's red. I think it's interesting it's to be tied to the window as a sign. But I think the most important thing for our consideration this morning is that it represents the final step of her faith obedience she ties the scarlet cord in the window, which means what? She believes that God will show her mercy and hangs that thing in the window so when the Israelites come in, they will see that house and not bring harm to her and her family. Now, in ending, I want to tell you that I said at the beginning, Rahab changed or was used by God to help change the history of the world. If you go to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, before we get to the Christmas story, at first glance, it looks like Matthew wants to ruin Christmas with a boring genealogy. And he gives us unpronounceable names, and this person begat this person, and that person begat that person, and we don't even know what begat means. So we don't know what to do, and we just pretend that it's yes, yes, begats, yes. Yes, begone, begat, yes. Such things are spiritual and King James-ish. And I will stick with it. But it's just a genealogy that shows the lineage, the ancestral line of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And there's women in it. Now, that's shocking enough in and of itself because you did not put women in an ancient genealogy. I'm sorry, ladies. 
It was a patriarchal, male-dominated world, so women would never find their way into it anyway. But here there's four of them. In the ancestral line of Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself, and I want you to notice these four, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Now, it's not time to go into it, but if you remember the story of Tamar, she disguised herself as a prostitute and deceived Judah. Second on the list, oh, there she is, Rahab. <laughs> She's Boaz's mother. Remember Boaz, who married Ruth? She's a harlot from the land of Canaan. She's not an Israelite, and she's a wayward woman. Thirdly, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. You say, well, now, Ruth is a pretty good person. She was, but she would bring up embarrassment to people. First of all, you remember, she's from Moab. She's not Jewish. She's a Moabitess. These were the descendants of Lot through an incestuous relationship with one of his daughters. That's where the Moabites came from. Ouch. I mean, who's the PR guy behind this genealogy? And finally, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. She's not even named, but that's Bathsheba, who David saw bathing one night on the roof and desired her, ordered his men to take her in. The wife of Uriah the Hittite, who was involved with Israel's most embarrassing political scandal, as King David committed fornication with her. <laughs> They're in the genealogy that leads to Jesus Christ. Now, uh, F. Dale Bruner has a wonderful quote on this. He says, the four model matriarchs of Jewish history were Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, the wives, respectively, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These four women are conspicuous by their absence here. Their husbands are all here, and so there was opportunity for Matthew to include the good wives, but Matthew gives the church four new matriarchs, and all of them preach the gospel of the deep and wide mercy of God. These four scandals in their way preach the gospel of divine mercy, which is Matthew's whole mission to proclaim. Matthew will later teach us that Jesus came not for the righteous, but for sinners. But already in his genealogy, Matthew was teaching us that Jesus came not only for, but through sinners. God did not begin to stoop into our sordid human story at Christmas only. He was stooping all the way through the Old Testament. See, this is what God does. This is what he's always done. He finds the outsider. He finds it down an outer who doesn't fit the M.O. and shows mercy. This is what he loves to do. He is inclined to give mercy. There is more mercy in Christ than there is sin in us. R.C. Sproul reminds us how this affects the mission of our church. Rahab was a Gentile. She was not one of Abraham's physical descendants and yet was accepted into Israel, God's people. She foreshadows the great engrafting of Gentiles into the church now happening under Christ. Like her, those who are outside the people of God today can join his kingdom if they place their faith in Christ alone. Do you realize if you are here on the sound of my voice this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are welcome to embrace him? Here's the thing. There is no prerequisite step. All that you need is to know that you need his mercy and to believe that he will give it to you if you ask. You ask him to be your Savior and Lord. And like Rahab, the scarlet cord is tied over your life. And you will not, you will not receive the judgment you deserve, but the mercy that you don't. Well, let me end how the text comes back full circle. Does not let us linger and think that Rahab is the main character. These spies come down from the hills, they pass over the Jordan, they come back to Joshua, they tell them all that happened, and what do they say? Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands. Now, I'm sure they told him about Rahab, but they do not lead with that, do they? The Lord is working. He is the hero of the story. He is the one who is mighty and majestic and merciful. And let's close our service by singing about him. Father, thank you that your mercy is super abundant. I remember, Lord, our friend Roscoe, so often praying for lost family members 
and would simply pray to you, Lord, just as you showed mercy unto me and opened my eyes, I know that you can extend that mercy to these that I love and open theirs as well. Thank you, Lord, that your mercy is deep and wide. Your grace is amazing. And we want to sing of it this morning. We want to exalt you and extol you just as Rahab did. Lord, we, like her, are spiritually wayward. We, like her, are outsiders. We, like her, are not worthy. But we, like her, have found mercy because of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for his shed blood. We thank you for his love for sinners. We praise you that he is willing to forgive all our sins and welcome us into the family of God. May we sing for him and him alone. In Jesus' name, amen.